first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here talking about, to be able to talk about design with, with you guys especially. Um, I think it's important, it sort of sets the tone, I think, for the rest of what you'll probably hear today. And I think it might give you a unique, uh, or a better, a better perspective, I should say, um, on how to think about um, the end result of, of products as you guys go through the rest of your sessions today. But, um, you know, Chris sort of mentioned a little bit about my background, but so I am the head of design at SoftServe now. And I think what that means for me personally is that I identify myself as a product designer. And so design is, has been a part of my life for a very long time. So, but I'm really sort of interested just before I get started of, of the makeup of the crowd here. So just so I know how to focus this in on a little bit on, on what you guys need to know. So I'm just curious, just like sh a show of hands, how many people here identify as a product manager or want to identify as a product manager? Okay, what about project manager? What are all the rest of you doing here? <laughs> so tell me this, how many, the rest of you, how many of you identify or I should say in your daily work affect some sort of product or want to affect some sort of product? That should be all of you, raise your hands. All right, thank you. That's great. So what I'm going to be talking about today is, is how we can all do that. And you're probably wondering, like, you know, we came here to, it's, it's a product camp, why are we starting with this, you know, a conversation about design? And you're probably even more confused by the title that I put on my topic, which was, you are a designer and I am a prototype. And that's intentionally confusing, I think. Um, and we'll sort of understand why, hopefully, at the end of this, this talk. So, are you a designer? That shouldn't be a surprise that you see that question based on the topic that I gave you. But I, I want to see another show of hands of people that the answer is yes for right now. So are you a designer? If you are, if you think of yourself as a designer, please raise your hand. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, but do you, do, well, what is design? I guess that's a better question. So let's talk about that. So design. Um, I think the best way for me to sort of explain what my perception or my, my, my point of view on what design is, is to sort of tell you a story. So I'm not going to preach at you about like pixels and Photoshop and, you know, all those types of things that a lot of people associate design with today. Today I'm going to tell you a story. And it begins in the 1980s. And so this is a time period where things were clearly being designed. So we have, you know, computers happening and these little phones are starting to be made and Michael Jackson's glove. And so all these cool things, people are making these things and there's probably some sort of design process around these, right? So meanwhile, in Texas, that's where I am. And so, Let's go back to 1988. This is Matt, clearly me, who suspiciously looks like me. He's an he's a overwhelmingly adorable little boy, um, and he's trying to figure out what he wants to be, and he's learning about life, right? So one day he's at school. I'll just say I. It, it was me, right? So I was at school one day, and my teacher asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And Chris is going to think he's right now because of this. But this is what I wrote. I would like to be an artist when I grow up. So when I was, I was eight years old in that photo, right? And this is literally what I wrote. This is a photograph of this piece of paper that I wrote on. I want to be an artist when I grow up. And clearly I was on my way to being an amazing artist with this sketch, this, this drawing at the bottom. So, 11 years went by, essentially. And what happened in that 11 years? Well, I kept sort of going down that pathway of being an artist. 
You know, I got really involved in painting and drawing. Um, I did some cool stuff for my mom there. And then, like, I drew this awesome baseball player. Um, I even painted, like, my own face over there for some reason. And so, you know, this sort of stuck with me for a long time through high school until, like, you know, all the way through my teens. And I really had a passion for creativity, making things, creating things. And eventually, at some point, I realized that, I didn't realize, I guess, I, I, I thought for some reason that there's no real way to make a living using these types of skills. And I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life, so I eventually started to focus more on academics. And I made my way to, to university to go study more or less things like psychobiology and, and neuroscience in the brain. Um, and so I went to a liberal arts school in, in Tennessee and I studied those things. I, I had a focus on psychology, especially social psychology. And, um, and I thought one day that I was going to grow up and be a psychiatrist and really understand why people's brains worked the way that they did. And, but even then, I was still, the first semester of my, my university experience, I was taking painting classes. And so it never really left me. And so at some point, you know, in our lives, we have moments that change us. Everyone has these times where you pivot or you, you know, at some point. So for me, that day was December 30th, 1999. So what happened on this day? So this was my first semester of, of when I was at university and I, I came home during our, what was our, like our winter break, our Christmas break. And I was back home and I was spending time with friends and family and that's why I was there. And so on this night, um, something happened and I don't really know what happened. And what it, I was there with friends, I remember that. And then after that, it's really the last thing I remember. I was sitting with a group of friends. And then the next thing I remember is I woke up and I was laying on my back and I was looking up at the sky. I didn't really know what I was looking at. It was just a bright light. And eventually that sort of light focused, you know, it, something, it was a little cloudy and hazy. And it focused in and I saw this colored glass. It was like stained glass. I don't know if you guys know what stained glass, but it was this colored glass. And then, I, you know, I tried to look around the, to figure out where I was, and I, I couldn't really, like, I was trying to turn my head, but I was sort of stuck. And it was just white everywhere, except for these lights above me. And then, finally, I heard someone coming toward me, and, and then I saw a face above me, and it was a nurse. And I was trying to figure out what was happening. I was looking around. You know, and then I couldn't turn my head to either side. And then I, she said, I finally heard a voice, and she said, are you, you're awake, do you know where you are? And I said, no, I don't know where I am, I can't figure anything out. And she said, well, you're in the hospital, you were in an accident. And so, this is sort of what happened. And then, what, you know, she, she said, it's okay, everything's gonna be okay. And I was trying to, you know, I was struggling, I was fighting, trying to move. And then what she basically, she, what she told me was that my car had flipped and it rolled several times and I was ejected out of the car. And I flew through the air about 10 meters, I think, or so. And I landed on my face, essentially, on the ground. And the result of that was I broke my neck right about here. And so when I was laying there, I couldn't move anything. I couldn't even move my arms at that point. And so this was a turning point in my life, obviously, for a lot of reasons. And so what happened was that led to a lot of time where I had to, to th figure things out. And so I had to, to sort of relearn a lot of things. And so I spent three months in a rehabilitation hospital trying to relearn how to live life with a new set of constraints, essentially. And so I had to figure 
all of these things out. I mean, basic things like eating, how do I feed myself, how do I brush my teeth, how do I, you know, get dressed, how do I drive, how do I go anywhere, what do I, what do, I do? And so I spent three months with these people that specialize in teaching people how to live in a world that probably doesn't work for them anymore. And so this was really a, a turning point in my life. And what happened was, this really doesn't want to change. You know, I, my life came, became about pr solving problems, like in every aspect of my life. And so, like I said, I was sent out to a world that wasn't ever really, you know, no one thought about my situation and how I was going to use their stuff. And so, this type of thing is something that I deal with on a daily basis now. I mean, I think, luckily, there's a great example right over here to the right of me about how I got onto this podium. Like, there wasn't really a way for me to get up here at all. But luckily, we sort of come up, came up with the solution. There was a problem, and then we sort of figured out that I had a need to get up here, right? And that there was a value of me being up here so you guys could see me. And so we made something. And it worked. And so now I'm here. And so this was sort of when I realized that there was a transformation happening. I wasn't, you know, I had all that creat creativity that I'd always spent on being an artist and, and painting and drawing and all those things. But now I was sort of transferring that creativity into solving problems. And for me, there is a difference. And so when we talk about the difference between art and design, I think it's real. And so, what is the difference? I think it has to do with an outcome of some sort and a process of making things. And so for me, all these things that I used to do were just things that I made. And I didn't know why I was making them. No one was telling me why. Or they weren't being made for a reason. But then I started thinking about problem solving, and there's a process with that. And so every day, you know, I'm trying to figure out a way to do something. Or I'm trying to figure out a way to make a product for someone. And for me, there's a process to that. And that process is design. And so for me, design isn't the end product. It's not the screen that you see at the end. It's not the application that you have. It's the purpose behind that thing. It's the intent. It's the plan. It's everything that happens to create that solution. And that, for me, is what design is. And it's not just me, by the way. This book was written in 1968 or 9, somewhere in the, in the 60s. But Norman Potter wrote in that book about design. For him, it was conceiving of an action, a fashioning of a means to carry it out, and then an estimation of its effects. So what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And what's the value? And so this has been around for a very, very long time. I mean, people have been creating solutions for problems for a while. Um, and so I sort of started to realize that all of these things that we use every day, everyone, everything that, that's happening, like this table, this, this screen, this projector, you know, all of the things that we have, everything is designed. And so there was some sort of process that happened when everything was designed. And so for me, really, it's, there's just good and bad. So there's good design and there's bad design, but there's really nothing in between. So let's talk about an example of good design. And I'm going to keep this related to the story that I'm telling you. And I want to show you this photo. This, for me, looks really complicated, but it's really a pretty good design. It's very thoughtful design. And what happens is, you know, there was this elevation, right? And so they built all these stairs for people that could walk, to walk up these stairs. But they also created this happy path for me that has, where they removed all of the barriers for me so that I could get straight to where I wanted to go. And it was the easiest way to get there. And so they removed all of these, these barriers. I didn't have these blockers to get through the path that I wanted to accomplish. There's also bad design. So this is another one. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's a door that opens two stairs. And so there's really n nowhere for me to go at this point, which creates an extreme pain point for me. I can't go here. 
So it's the equivalent of a software experience of some sort to where you have a, a login, let's call it a login screen, and you can't log in, or a registration, and you can't register. So you can't use the thing at all. So they're blocking me at the very first point of, the very first touch point here. Because they didn't think about anything. Well, they th probably thought about something, but they didn't think about me. And, you know, it's hard for, for people to imagine all of the people that are going to use all of their stuff. Like, that's just the way the world works. But if we use empathy, we can get at least a little bit closer to that. And so what is empathy? It's really the ability to understand the feelings of other people, right? And so I think what happened to me in that transition point in my life is that I stopped focusing so much on, on me and what I wanted by painting and drawing and all these things that I was doing for myself. And I sort of had this change in my, in my way of thinking. I mean, it was as if I was sort of, as other abilities were removed, I, I, I was magically given this sort of superpower of empathy to where I could sort of understand everyone's problems because I was so suddenly um, presented with all these challenges and I had to think about these things all the time. And so now, as a designer, when I, I think about users, I can empathize with, you know, 100% of my energy because I understand the pains that come with not being able to use a thing properly. And, but it's not a superpower. I said it was a superpower, but it's not something that only I can do. It's not a thing that happened because of something happened to me. It's something that all of you guys could and should be doing in every aspect of your work. It's thinking about who's using your stuff and how you can make it better for them. And that's what empathy is. And so empathy, really, it's what allows us to use this process, a human-centered approach. To get those human-centered outcomes, it requires empathy for these people who are using your things. And that's why it's so important for all of us to do this. This is a quote from Tim Brown, who's one of the forefathers of design thinking. And what he said to us was, it's not us versus them, them being the users. It's not even us on behalf of them, it's really us with them. So we should be working hand in hand with our users to understand what their needs are, to understand what their pain points are, so that we can not only advocate for them, but act as if we are them when we're creating anything that we create. So at that point in my life, I understood what empathy was. I went and got a formal a new formal education around design and then I started working as a designer and so today I already told you this is how I see myself I am a designer and the process with which I design is what we call design thinking I'm not going to go through a detailed explanation of design thinking today because that could take a while but essentially for us it's an empathetic human-centered approach to delivering innovative solutions so Chris talked about that intersection of technology and business. When we talk about human, or pardon me, design thinking and human-centered design, it's the same intersection, but it's also the intersection, let's call it this, the intersection between the human element, the need, the human value, the business value and the feasibility, that we're talking about business requirements, and then the technical feasibility and the technical constraints that we have. So it's really not just a crossroads of those two areas. There's the third area, which is the human element, which is the user element. But right there in the middle of that, in the center, that's where all this innovation can happen. Because rather than thinking about things in terms of requirements or you know, being told exactly what to do, we should focus on outcomes and what the needs of the users are. And that's what gives us the space to sort of innovate around solutions. So we're not constrained by being told exactly what we need to do. It's more about understanding the user, understanding their problem, understanding what value we need to provide, and then through that process that we can go through from research all the way through deploying something and testing it, that's where we have the room to innovate and really start recommending real, real points of view to, to clients about what they need. 
So one way that we do that is through rapid prototyping. Um, it gives us the ability to test things fast, gives us the ability to fail fast, but it's also the way that we can get to insights the fastest. And so it's a very, very cheap way, an easy way, the cheapest way, I think, um, to get to insights. And so if we talk about what a prototype is, it's really just a model of a thing. And so it's the basis for which you can create new versions later. And so even in our daily life, like this solution over here that we've, we've made to get, for, to get me onto this podium, I would say that that's a prototype. It could probably be made better, but it was a good first try at how I could actually get here. So I made it up here, but I think I've got some recommendations on how to make that a little more less sketchy, because I might fall off of that when I'm going down. Um, but that's sort of the point, right? Like, in my everyday life, I'm creating things like that to try to accomplish tasks. They may work, they may not. If they don't, I try something else. And we do the same thing when we're designing products. Because, like I said, it's the cheapest artifact that we can create to test any kind of assumption that we have. So we're assuming a lot of things when we design. We're assuming that what we're making is the best solution for people. We have to test those things, we validate those things, but that's the great thing about design is that we can use prototypes and things like testing to find out at the end if we're right or not. And so when we deliver things to clients, we deliver solutions that we know work, but without that validation, we're really just assuming we're guessing. And so I should say that the, when I was talking about, when I, the, when I put the title of this talk into the, the program, I said that I'm a prototype also. And I do mean that. And I think the point, part of the point of the story is to show you how I've changed over the years, the transitions that I've made through that process, how I've gotten to where I've come. And it, you know, that, that happens because everything that's around me impacts the current version of myself. And so you think about the world changes, I'm changing every day, my team, every, all of the impact that they can give to me, what I can give to them, um, you know, my family, my friends, all of these things help shape who I am. And so I'm always a new version of myself. So when I say that I'm a prototype, that's really what I mean, because I'm not really ever going to be finished. So my development will continue because I keep learning new things. You guys are prototypes too. As you learn new things, you're going out as a new version of yourself trying all these things out. And you're trying to validate it if they're right or wrong. And so, for me, I'll show you a, a few examples of just the types of artifacts that we can create when we're testing for products. This is just a paper prototype. And then we have sort of mock-ups that we can do, 3D printing of things, and then just making stuff out of whatever we have laying around. And the goal is to, like I said, is to create prototypes cheaply and quickly. So you really only need to get to the fidelity that is required for the audience that you're prototyping to. So whoever's looking at it, as long as you can make something that they can understand, that's as good as it needs to be. And so there's this, I already told you that I'm a prototype. So there's this um, formula that sort of comes out of the Stanford Deed School about prototyping, which is this rapid, rough, rapid, and right. And so really what it means is that we've got to start to get people comfortable with seeing things at lower fidelity. And so when you start talking about what we can show to clients, what we can show to stakeholders, we need to start moving them away from thinking that prototypes are some sort of end product, because they're not. I mean, they're a means to an end. And so we have to sort of change the mindset of the people that we, we are talking to. And then rapid is just, we've got to do it fast. I mean, we've got to fail fast so we can learn fast and deliver faster. I think I sort of already spoke to that. And then right. So make sure we're testing the right stuff. Make sure it's at the right fidelity. Because if it's not, then we're not doing it right. And so I think that sort of brings us back to my original question to you guys, is are you a designer? Well, everyone's a designer. So the answer is yes. You don't get to answer. I'm answering for you. Um, but you have a huge opportunity. So you are a designer because you are affecting the outcome of the products that you make. And that's, I have a, look, I, my passion is for the user and protecting that person and doing everything I can for that person to be able to use a thing. 
But some of the best relationships, working relationships that I've ever had, anywhere I've been, from agency life to working at enterprises, has been direct relationships with product management. Because they are there to validate me and I'm validating them, or we're working together to build solutions for people. And so you have a huge opportunity to affect people's lives and to make people's lives better. And as long as you can think about the people that you're doing it for and what outcomes you need to achieve, then you are, you are a designer. I mean, and that's a, it's a huge opportunity to affect the world and people's lives every day. I mean, you get to, you get to help people. You can change people's lives, literally. And that's why you have such a responsibility. Because it's sort of on you to manage these products or experiences. And so it's not a, a responsibility to be taken lightly because it really does affect people's lives. And so when I think about you know, the way that we should be approaching creating products and, and talking to clients and recommending solutions, this is what I say. So we put users in the, ex in the center of the product, but we should put design at the heart of their business. And if we can get businesses to understand that, if we can get clients to understand that, then it, it wins for everyone. We get to make great things, they get to profit from great things, and users get to use great things. So this is your responsibility and this is your goal. Go design that happy path. Figure out what the barriers are. Remove those barriers. Don't make blockers for your users. Because if you're not making users' lives easier, this is on you, because you're making their lives harder. So that's my challenge to you, is to go make something better. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> if I can take a couple of questions, maybe. I think if we're okay on time. Do you want to have any questions? Hi. Pay for the solution or the prototype? I uh, can't pay for the realization of full prototype. Well, that's exactly why we have different fidelities of prototype. So I would match the prototype that's created to the budget that exists. And, and that's the thing. That's part of changing that, I, that, I, that culture of prototyping and, and especially working with clients to understand that you can test functionality at a very low fidelity. I mean, we can, it's not expensive to draw on pieces of paper and cut it out with scissors and demo an experience. It's free, essentially. So I don't see budget constraints on prototyping. No, but, uh, prototype is perfect and customer oh. is fully satisfied of this prototype. But he hasn't enough of money to pay for implementation of such product. Fire that client. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, I would put that... As, I mean, I don't, th that's a, a complicated question because I don't like cutting corners to make the experience almost good enough. Okay. So I would, I, would, I would push for the right experience and then there would probably be some other people involved in that process to help figure out what we could do for that client. Okay, if happy pass impossible, need to find other happy pass. We need to find, no, we need to find how it's possible. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is there some uh, uh, markers that you understand that uh, you're doing something uh, that it's not uh, exactly what client needs? Well, we should be telling them what they need. So we should do the work ahead of time so that we know what they need. We shouldn't be told what a client needs from a client um, if we understand their business. So we need, what we need from them is their subject matter expertise so that we can go out and form recommendations around the user, around the research that we do. So when we talk about requirements, I hope that product managers are not going to clients and asking what the requirements are. My hope is that we are going to clients and telling them what our recommendation is for the requirements. 
to solve the needs that we have uncovered for them, if that helps. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, my name is Taras. I would like to ask you about uh, this design question. I am not a designer. Yeah, uh, you are. I just told you you're a designer. Yeah, yeah but uh, as a product manager, I want to be more creative as a designer. Besides what you mentioned, what can I do about it? Thank you. Be more creative. <laughs> I mean, look, think about problems. You're problems you're, if you're a project manager, you're a problem solver. So do better. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think we probably need a handover now. All right, thank you very much.